Welcome back on to the David L. Gray Show, Voicing Truth and Reason. Today, I have a fascinating interview for you. You know, for the past few decades, many of you have asked me, hey, you got to interview Dr. E. Michael Jones. And it's an interview I wanted to do. I just didn't quite know what we would talk about that you didn't already know. But I was over at my friend's podcast, Patrick Coffin, and I was listening to this interview that he did with Dr. E. Michael Jones about a recently published book of his called The Dangers of Beauty. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I've got to have him on. So he's coming on. But before we get started, a big shout out to all my supporters on Patreon and a YouTube membership name scrolling below. Um, and as I say, you guys pay the bills around here because somebody has to. So I appreciate you. I'm looking for more supporters. If you are interested, just click on the Patreon link below. Check out the benefits if it interests you. Um, like I said, the best benefit is it that, you know, you get to say that you support David L. Gray. So that's really cool. You can tell your friends about that. Otherwise, just keep me in your prayers, keep me in your likes, your subs, and your shares, all that good stuff. Hounds of heaven. Let's get into the show. Hovering over the skies of a post-Christian society, we have spotted a man with a donut in one hand oh. and rosary beads in another. Child, I'm about to whoop Satan's behind. He is boldly proclaiming truth and reason like no rigid Catholic ever has before. The David L. Gray Show begins now. For nearly four decades, Dr. E. Michael Jones has been exploring the disarray in the Catholic Church that caused it to enter into an adulterous relationship with the world. Dr. Jones is the editor of Culture Wars magazine, a frequent lecturer, author of <laughs> numerous books, to say the least. Most recently, those books include the widely acclaimed Logos Rising. You know, I also listened to several interviews about that, which I'm sure many of you have is really popular. Um, and also another recent book is our topic for today, The Dangers of Beauty, The Conflict Between Mimesis and Concupiscence in the Fine Arts. You can find this book at fidelitypress.org or culturewars.com. So this interview is not so much a book review of the dangers of beauty, but really a follow-up to the interview, the podcast I heard over on Patrick Jones. And, and that's back in September of 22. I'm going to place a link in the description box. So please click on it. I recommend it. Listen to it. But the work for today here on this podcast, uh, we're just going to dig deeper into the subject matter itself and discuss more about this conflict between mimesis and concupiscence in the fine arts. Welcome on to the David L. Gray Show, Dr. E. Michael Jones. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. So, you know, great conversations begin, I think, with great definition. So if you can, please, how, how are you using the term, the word beauty in your book? Unity in multiety. It's the shortest and best definition. Uh, Coleridge came up with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I cover him in the book, came up with this definition, the English formulation of this difference. Uh, I'm sorry, the English uh, formulation of this definition. Okay. So it, 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 there's another way of talking about it. You could talk about uh, existence and essence. Okay. A combination of existence and essence where uh, it, it's so real that you think it's part of life, but it's so well organized that you can think of it as geometry. It's a combination of those two things. That's also, if you take that to its ultimate conclusion uh, and combine absolute existence and absolute essence, you have the definition of God. And if you put those two things together, uh, that's called the beatific vision, uh, which means, we, uh, and we'll be happy to watch that, uh, look at that for eternity. 
So yeah. that and and this also brings us to the point of beauty being a transcendental, uh, the one, the good, the true, the beautiful. Drop out the one. There's just let's just talk about three. The true, the good, and the beautiful are all aspects of God. They're all aspects of being, uh, which is the fundamental definition of God. Yeah, man, that's <laughs> that's a lot there, and that's a lot there that I definitely want to get in, get into, especially in as it relates to the church, how it relates to how we evangelize, how it relates to just culture itself, and what I think is just really just a post truth society. But I want to stay just there for a moment on beauty and existence and essence because it sounds like, and you did touch on this in the interview I heard on Patrick Coffin. You did talk about Plato and Aristotle. You, you, um, um, and, and you did so, so, but that's in, in when you say that the existence in essence, that's what I'm hearing with Plato talking about how he, how he kind of viewed form, um, right. and, and, and beauty. And but when he was talking about beauty, um, in form, what wouldn't when Plato say that there's just beauty is one. And what well, form is one, and that is, in so, so take an apple for as, as as you know for example, there is one beautiful apple, but doesn't the apple over time doesn't it decay and so does so does form lose its beauty after a while? Okay, Aristotle said art is imitation of nature. All right. That's what we mean by when we say the word mimesis. Mimesis yeah, is the Greek word for imitation. So that is what art is. That is all it's ever going to be. It will never be anything else than that. But what changed over the period of time that I'm dealing with in this book is the understanding of nature. And so if you go back to the beginning, we're talking uh, the, the ideas of the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle. You yeah. have a very definite idea of nature, which is basically that you have the world that you see, the world we perceive with our senses, which is total flux. It's always changing. It's, all, it's meaningless flux. But mm -hmm. the other side of the coin, that we, you could call that existence, okay? The other side of the coin is that there is a world of forms which is eternal, which you could right. call essence, and that never changes. So from Plato's point of view, the idea of uh, art is basically taking one of those forms from the realm of form and imposing it on matter. So to be more concrete, you could take, let's say, a triangle uh, mm -hmm. from the realm of forms. You impose that on matter. You take uh, a circle, another form, you pose that on matter and you get a column. You take a rectangle and you pose, uh, impose that on stone and you get a beam. You put them together and you've got a temple. And a temple is where you worship God because it has it is made up of these forms. Right. That, that, that's the simplest way to understand uh, mimesis from a platonic point of view. And that never changes. Like for the, again, for the apple, for, in, for example, you know, it, it's the, when it comes from, in, from the form, it's just always beautiful. It's always true because it's true essence is it never changes. But once it gets to, as you say, the temple and it, 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 it gets to our realm, um, what I guess what I'm trying to get to is that beauty, how do we know that, how do we understand beauty is something that's objectively true in yeah, art? You're, yeah, because what you're talking about is uh, the op if you bring up the opposite, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That makes yeah. it com completely subjective. But if beauty were totally in the eye of beholder, the beholder, we would never have museums. Because a museum is a place where you have artifacts that everyone considers beautiful. Everyone mm -hmm. considers them beautiful. So there must be some type of objective reality here right. that we, what we're talking about. Now, the, man, the Greek who understood this best was Pythagoras. Yeah. Uh, and he understood, he, he felt that uh, uh, Plato was a student of Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras felt that the world, uh, there was a hidden grammar to the universe and it was number. And that there were certain ratios that were pleasing. 
and yeah. everyone felt uh, everyone felt that they were pleasing and and uh, it was objectively true so once you say there's a ratio that's pleasing you're putting it into the world there there you have the golden ratio one manifestation of the golden ratio which yeah. he thinks uh, everyone thinks is uh, uh pleasing uh there are other manifestations if you go to the uh the um the painting i don't know whether you got this from my book but if the the painting of uh, uh the baptism of christ mm -hmm. uh by uh, forget <laughs> his name escapes me uh, the baptism of Christ uh, has is a manifestation of the of the golden ratio, uh, and, and that was a way of framing the the picture. And uh, what what happened over this period of time is that the beginning with Giotto in Italy, the artist started to have an understanding of the world that differed from the understanding the Greeks had. And the main reason it differed was because of the advent of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Christ Christianity, Plato, Plato, neither Plato nor Aristotle understood that the world was created. They had no right. idea of creation. They thought the world was eternal, uh, and that made it God. And they just succumbed to pantheism. And that point, you can't really separate the world from God or yourself, and it just becomes a kind of mishmash. That all changed when. Uh, Genesis, the first sentence of Genesis when it says God, uh, God in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Yeah. That and was I think a, a completely different, a completely different world because now the world is created and it becomes right. an artifact. It becomes, God becomes an artist. The world becomes an artifact and you can learn about the mind of God simply by studying the world or portraying the world uh, in its true, in its true eternal forms. And some people may have when I was when I was in school, at least at least undergraduate. I don't even know if I even talked about art in graduate school. But um, the what's it called the Fibonacci, right? That that's one right. that I was probably more familiar with. I'll put that on the screen in case some people are more familiar with that. Right. Yeah. There we go. And so, and so the golden ratio in the Fibonacci, what they're, what they're saying is that um, art just has beauty or art has just have certain patterns, right? And, they, and um, Pythagoras was, you know, is a mathematician um, that we still study today, um, the, the Pagor, um, uh And so, and so it was ratios in, at least with the Fibonacci, it was, I think, um, two forms or, or two squares um the third one is going to be equal to those two it was it's just this beautiful ratio that we could find in nature we could see with trees we could right. see it everywhere um so and so but so if if this is this is true what are we saying then with how is how is that in conflict the the image with the imitation of, of nature what, what is the conflict well, you could take those ratios and, and you can describe them as as ratios and their relationship to each other, and you end up with geometry. And mm -hmm. there's nothing there's nothing wrong with geometry. It's a it's true. It's a manifestation of the truth, but it's not a manifestation of beauty. Because in order to have beauty, you have to have geometry and life. Okay, if you just have life, okay, you can look out your window. And that's life, and it's not really satisfying because it's really not organized. Or you yeah. can have geometry, which is satisfying in a way, but when you make it visual, it's a pattern, and it's not its not life. So you can have life, which is not organized, or you can have organization, which has no life to it. They're both okay, but that's not what art is. Art is a combination of the two together. Oh, okay. So it's the first, I think the first manifestation you have when you're viewing art is that's real. I'm amazed. That's real. I like, I was, I was 12 years old when I saw the Pieta for the first time. And that was at the New York World's Fair. And so I was on a, a, a moving conveyor belt and we just went by this thing. It was out there in kind of like a darkened room with a light shining on it. And I thought, I can see the vein in the bicep of Jesus Christ. 
and that's marble. How did he do that? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, on a conveyor belt. I'm on the other side of the room behind a glass screen, and I suddenly, this is real. That's the first yeah. manifestation you have when it's, when it's art because it's got to be real. That's reality. And then once you, the more you look at it, the more organized it becomes, and that's where you have this satisfaction. Now, you, you, what you, you don't perceive it first as real and then it's organized. What you perceive is a burst of beauty, which is absolute reality and absolute organization at the same time. That's why, that's why you're drawn to beauty. You just, when you see something like that, you just want to stand there and look at it. So I've had experiences, aesthetic experiences in my life, like when I saw, uh, Ruben's portrait of the Princess Spinola Doria at the Toledo Museum. Hmm. Funny, I, it's a big plays a big role in the book. Or the Taj Mahal. When I saw that, I just stood there. When you walk through that big portal, you have to walk there. They won't let you drive there. There's no parking lot there. You, you get in a camel-driven cart. You get dropped off at this big entryway, like a building in itself. You walk through, and suddenly it's like this explosion where you see everything all at once. You see the garden, you see the stream, you see the Taj Mahal, and it's all there, all of that multiplicity, all unified. And you see multiplicity and unity all at once, and that's called beauty. You just want to stand there and look at it. Wow, because that's, wow. that's, what, that's what you'll do in eternity if you get to heaven. You will look at God, the beatific vision, which will be unity and multiplicity, and you'll be happy to watch it for all eternity. Yeah. And you just really answered my, 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 really my uh, one question I want to ask the, the relationship between beauty and truth. And in a way, you just explained all that. We're speaking with Dr. E. Michael Jones. Uh, we we're digging into a beautiful book that he had written. Um, I, I know it's on the website. You know, he kind of describes it. It can be a table book as well because it has a lot of images, a lot of stories. It's called The Dangers. A beauty you can find it at fidelitypress.com or just hop over to culture wars where wait, he wait. is fidelity fidelitypress.org or culturewars.com dot com. Um, you can find it there. And if you're listening to us on the audio platform, just drop us a review if you're listening to on Apple. So um also while I'm listening to you describe that relationship. In, in the in a way between relationship between beauty and, and truth, I was thinking that there has to be a relationship. The relationship between beauty and truth maybe also is another piece of it. Is is does it have to be imagination, right? I think you hear this come out in music, in art, the artist being inspired, you know, his imagination. But is that a conflict in society today? I think we live in a society today where I think we just lack imagination, uh, clearly, because I think we lack laughter. You look at mu movies, we just seem to repeat the same thing over and over again. Even some music just sounds repetitive. Are, do, do you think the world today lacks imagination? And because it lacks imagination, we've lost a sense of beauty. I would say we lost a sense of beauty because of moral decline. Because you, you need a certain element of rationality in order to understand beauty. And if your uh, uh, morality is practical reason. And so if, you're if your taste is constantly being debased and your mind is constantly being uh, deadened uh, by immorality, you won't be able to perceive beauty. Uh, uh, Pla Plato talked about this in terms of music. Uh, basically, uh, 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 if you have a distorted soul, largely because of immorality, mm -hmm. you're going to desire uh, distorted music. And I think that's what's happened over this period of time. I, I cover this in the, the last section of the book, which is about the 20th century. I've uh, Basically, what happened here is that taste became debased. The music became too sensual. Uh, and the, the, the sensuality uh, uh, always demands some type of more transgression as it goes on. And so it went from being something that was attractively sensual to something that was just ugly 
over a mm. period of time, over the period of the 20th century. So it relates to the soul. Wow. Yeah. And but so that would imagine, imagine it, so it also will have a stultifying effect on your imagination. Imagination is diff a difficult time, time term to define. I think Coleridge did it best when he talked about the he talked about the esomplastic power of the soul. Esomplastic is a Greek comes from the Greek means the ability to create unity. Hmm. Mind uh, the mind of the artist creates a unity by imitating nature. He sees, in a sense, the hidden grammar of nature. He understands how to put it together into something that is organized and alive at the same time. And when he achieves that, it's called beauty. Yeah. I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking of, um, I think it was in Spirit of Liturgy when Pope uh, when Joseph Ratzinger, he was talking about theology and he was talking about the role of the imagination in theology, how sensual that is. And um, so if, the, if there is a deformed soul, there's just moral decay, that's going to affect everything. Even when we, once we get to theology, you're going you're gonna to find you have a, a deformed theology because imagination isn't being properly ordered in the, in the right direction. It's not driven to, to unity, right? Right. If the more, the more the soul gets deformed by immorality, the less it will be able to... First of all, that's how... More, more practical reason is how you achieve the good in your life. So if you behave in an immoral fashion, you will not be able to achieve the good. If you live life in a, in a, unable to achieve the good, you're going to be frustrated intellectually. And you're mm -hmm. not going to be able to perceive beauty and your life will become more and more determined by uh, external pa passions uh, that will be manipulated by people who want to control you. And I've dealt with that in my book called The Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political yeah. Control. Yeah, I saw that. But why did you follow this? Uh, I, you know, I noticed somewhere that you, you had commented that this book was a, a type of follow-up to Logos is Rising. How does that, how, how does that play? Well, Logos is uh, the order of the universe. Uh, it's about metaphysics, and metaphysics is uh, uh, basically the study of being as being. And so that's about the transcendental known as the truth. You know that you've achieved the truth because your mind is at rest, and you don't have to feel you go, go any further. Mm -hmm. And it was that understanding of Logos that led me to the, the transcendentals uh, known as beauty. Uh, because th there's a connection here, and I've been trying. I I thought a lot about Germany. I think a lot about Germany because I lived in Germany, mm -hmm. and and uh, th one of the things I I said in this book is that the artist can oftentimes portray what the philosopher cannot explain, or the politician isn't allowed to say. Well, if there's <laughs> ever a place where politicians can't say anything. Approaching the truth, it's Germany. It is a conquered nation. It was uh, subjected to ruthless social engineering that basically wrecked the morality of the German people over the course of the, tw the 20th century. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, we're all, uh, you know, prone to sin. And there was a moment in my life uh, when I was in a state of apostasy as a you know, early young man. And I remember uh, listening to Handel's Messiah, and it, the beauty of it allowed me some type of access to the transcendental realm that I could not achieve through reason at that point. The beauty mm -hmm. got me up out of my chair, uh, took me to the church door, but it didn't bring me into the church. I had mm -hmm. to go to Germany before I uh, entered, uh, re-entered uh, the Catholic Church. So yeah, beauty, hard. beauty is important, and I'm, I'm saying. Right now, you can't say anything in Germany, anything. It, it, the, the people are totally crippled, but I, still, I do think they still have this relationship with beauty, especially through music, especially through somebody like Bach. And so I did a, did a video where I tried to wake the German people up, and what better way to wake the German people up than to play Sleepers Awake or Bach et hmm. Alf, the... the uh, not, not an oratory, whatever, a cantata, uh, whatever. It's a, a musical piece that I think resonates deeply with the German soul. That's yeah. the situation we're, we're in uh, in many ways through, throughout the world. 
it is often the situation we're in in certain periods of history. If you're talking about Elizabethan England, you could not tell the truth about the fundamental reality of that Protestant revolution, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the attack on the Catholic Church. And so you had to retreat into art. And I'm saying the man who did that was Shakespeare, who created yeah. this beautiful poetry that brought these people, the English people in their time of need, back to the transcendental realm that the Protestant Reformation had basically foreclosed. Yeah. It was there, and you can find it in Shakespeare, in, yeah, in the poetry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By, just to give you an example, uh, Ulysses' speech in Troilus and Cressida, which begins, take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows, is the best explanation of the Reformation in existence. The best Reformation of what that looting operation had achieved, and also what the end game uh, was going to be if you followed uh, that path down its, to its logical conclusion. Wow. We're speaking with Dr. E. Michael Jones um, here on the David O'Grey Show, voicing truth and reason. Do you think that we're living, um, and I probably know the answer to this, um, but it, at least it segues to another thing, that, you know, I'm looking at society today, and it's just, it's descent into atheism, it's descent into androgyny. <laughs> um, feelings, feelings seem to matter more than the truth. Everything matters more than the truth. I, I think the idea, that, you know, psychosis is just really just being normalized. You know, anybody can tell us anything nowadays. You know, if you want to call yourself a, 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 a ink pen, we're supposed to say, oh, yeah, you, you're definitely an ink pen. It's, it's just psychosis and, and it's being normalized. And I think it gets back to what you were saying about just that there's a logical flow. There's first principles and there's a logical flow when we lead those first principles. But, but would you call society today, would you, would you call many places in the world, would you call it just post truth or would you call it something else? Degenerate. Degenerate. I think the, uh, a better, the German word is better. The German word for Degeneracy is entartung. Art is the word for form. It means you've lost the form. Mm -hmm. Degeneracy means you've lost the form. Now, wh what we're seeing here is that it was art that led the West into this period of degeneracy. It was breaking the form, and specifically in the visual art, it was moving away from mimesis. And that happened... Mm -hmm. um, 1907, <laughs> I pretty much named the day and the hour when it happened. And we're, <laughs> Talk we're, about that. <laughs> uh, we're talking about uh, a man by the name of Picasso, uh, who had talent as an artist, was living in Paris at the time. Uh, and he had was a man who was unable to control his passions, particularly his sexual passions. Yeah. And so he's involved in one affair uh, after another. And he started to express the disorder in his paintings. And so the first modern painting was Les Dames d'Avignon, a big painting by Picasso. It was a, 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 a kind of a mockery of uh, Cezanne's uh, Grand Bagneur, uh, because in this, that's just women, naked women bathing at the seashore. Uh, this one is whores kind of exhibiting themselves. And some of them have, they have African mass faces. One of them looks like a baboon. There's a deliberate type of transgression and distortion that goes into this picture, a deliberate type of exhibitionism that was scandalous at the time. It seems tame by comparison now, but that's what it was at the time. And yeah. uh, he, nobody would have known anything about Picasso if it weren't for a Jew from Germany by the name of Kahnweiler who showed up in Paris with a lot of family money and decided to become an art dealer. Yeah. And he put Picasso together with Georges Braque, and they created this dance craze called Cubism. And at that point, you have this transformation. You have cultural revolution on the terms of the artist, and you have the dealer now becoming the major player in the art world, which is exactly what happened during the 20th century. What happens here is the far when you move away from mimesis, which is exactly what Picasso did, 
the art dealer becomes the most important figure. Because you can't tell whether it's right or wrong, upside down, right side up, you can't tell. And by the time the big uh, transformation in this point came with uh, the rise of abstract expressionism, uh, yeah. we, another Jewish dealer by the name of Castelli got his start. He was the guy who created Andy Warhol and pop art. And with uh, the high point of that would be somebody like Jackson Pollock. And you can't, there's no mimesis whatsoever in Jackson Pollock. He was called Jack yeah. Dripper because he'd punch holes in paint cans and kind of drip all over the canvas. Now, what? so why, why do we consider that art? We consider that art because Nelson Rockefeller bought them up and put them on the walls of the Chase Manhattan banks. So of truth uh, is the opinion of the powerful in our world. And at this point, beauty became the opinion of the powerful. That's how we had these uh, operations. Yeah, there's uh, Jackson Pollock. Is that right side up or upside down? You can't tell. Can you? See, that's the point of realism and why, I mean, you, you're smart. You're far more knowledgeable about this than me. I mean, you wrote the book on this, but I really thought that this was like the, the turning point of when society really start with this transition. We could talk about realism. I'd like you to talk about that because you, 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 you know, you, you, um, you, you, you have some thoughts about that. Um, and I think the world could probably use more realism today. When you once you, once you go on Instagram, you see all these filters, right? But anyway, <laughs> um, abstract art. Um, the thing about it is that, and I talk about this in a, in a class I have on on the introduction of theology to mass. Um, when I want to talk, you know, because we're talking about liturgy and we're talking about the problems of the Norvis Ordo, and I ask my my students to, you know. Look at this photograph and tell me what is the most, what sticks out to you. And if I have 20 students, you know, Dr. Michael Jones, they all point out usually 19 or 20 different things. And this is such a far departure. I mean, that's just that that's evidence itself that abstract art is not related to what you're talking about, about form and beauty, correct? Right. It's not my Mises. As soon as you leave my Mises, you don't, it's not art. Okay, so what, what feeling are you supposed to have? Let's say you walk into Chase Manhattan Bank and you see this on the wall there. Uh, what's your first, uh, what's the first thought that crosses your mind? It's, I must be really stupid. <laughs> or because, boss is dust. Be, what, because, what, is, what is this? <laughs> because, because I don't get it, but I don't get it. But Nelson Rockefeller does and he's rich. So therefore he must be smart. And so ah. the, what, what you're seeing here is power. Beauty is the opinion of the powerful. That's what this statement says. And you're some insignificant schmuck who doesn't matter at all. And all you, you just better get with the plan and start pretending that you can see the emperor's clothes here. Yeah. Now, was there a problem, though, with realism? Because realism, it was really just trying to have it you know it's like anti-instagram right it didn't it didn't want to fit the filters um it just wanted to portray in, in christian art it wanted to portray jesus christ as real as possible as many details as possible was there a problem with realism yeah the, at a certain point you can get so good at something that for next uh, generation uh they're not going to be imitating nature they're going to be imitating painting and when you start imitating painting as opposed to nature, it becomes cliched and people get tired of it. And I'm, I had to say this, but religious art is some, uh, there are some of the worst offenses here of this cliche is in religious art. Now, you can go to the opposite extreme, like Rouault, like I'm going to do really new religious art and it's ugly. Uh, so you have to find the balance here between something that is cliched and stereotyped, and people have done this too many times, to a complete anarchic rejection of the past, and I'm, the world begins with me, and history begins with me, and I'm... No, there's a, there's a golden mean here, because uh, art is imitation of nature. It's not imitation of other paintings. Mm, mm. And that's what realism doing. Realism today would be somebody just... I don't know, taking some sort of projector, putting it on a wall, and you're just really tracing it, right? That's all that realism is. That's hyper-realism. That, hyper that was the reaction to that Jackson Pollock painting you just saw. So that was 
that Jackson Pollock painting is like form, but no content. And then, so I'm going to do something really real. I'm going to take a picture of that street outside. I'm going to blow it up and I'm going to color in the dots and that will be real. No, that's not imitation either. Photography is not imitation. The only thing that can imitate nature is the human mind. The human mind can digest nature. It's what Hoth, uh, well, Coleridge said about this esomplastic power, can unify nature, can bring it together in a way a camera cannot. I get into big arguments all the time with people who are trying to tell me that photography is art. You can't have a machine imitating nature. It can mm. make an impression of something, but it doesn't imitate nature. Yeah, I never, I never thought about that, but you do hear that, you know, that some people do call them artists. They'll take a picture, they'll they'll touch it up, they'll do some sort of thing on Photoshop, and as art. But but you're saying that's just another expression of some sort of realism, right? It's not. It's not imitation. It's reproduction. So I I, I will grant you. I, I just think, I did a cover. I did an article after I did this book on the probably the most beautiful house in California. It's called yeah. the D.L. James House. It's now owned by Brad Pitt, who actually moved into it, unlike most movie stars who don't live in their houses. He's actually living there. And there was I was there. The family who owned it invited me. They were selling it. We get, This will be the last chance you have to see it. And as this, it's right on uh, or south, just south of Carmel on the coast. It's on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And yeah. just as the sun was going down, my friend uh, took a picture of me and my wife, and it's a beautiful picture because, first of all, the sunlight unifies everything because of the light. But you also have a background where a man organized nature. That's what architecture is. And so, obviously, there's an order to this thing that this lady captured by pressing a button. Okay, But that's not the way it works in general. The order, in other words... You can have mm -hmm. order there, but it's already been preformed by yeah. a mind already. Yeah. And all you're doing yeah. is, in a sense, copying it. And if it weren't yeah. for the sunlight at that particular moment, there would be, in a sense, very little unity to that picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my, so my friend, my friend, who, see, her genius was to know exactly when to press the button and what to aim it at. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the art had already been done by the, whoever did the, um, right. the landscaping and whoever yeah. created the universe. So yeah. <laughs> you know, by, by the way, do you know what you know what she, her prayer is? The the prayer of the family that sold this thing to Brad Pitt that Brad Pitt will be brought to God through the beauty of the house that he now owns. That's what they're, wow. that's a touching thought. Yeah. Speaking with Dr. E. Michael Jones about his book, The Danger of Beauty, the dangers of beauty, the conflict between mimesis and concupiscence. You can purchase the book, find out more about it at fidelitypress.org. Or just visit Culture Wars, take a look at some essays while you're there, and also take a look at all the books um, they have on the display there. Um, and very fine website. And this is the David O. Gray Show, Voicing Truth and Reason. I want to transition a little bit, Dr. Jones, to more some more things that relate specifically to some of the things that's going on in, to, in, in the Catholic space, okay? So I want to talk about, discuss beauty and liturgy for a moment. Um, when I think about, um, you know, that's something, you know, subject, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about, it, obviously. Um, and when I think about abstract, abstract art, what comes to mind is a lot of things about the church post Vatican II, right? That again, you know, you take a look at a Jackson Pollock and let's just think about the liturgy for a moment. Like just think of, of some of our, our, our church buildings that we have today. I think they're, they're designed in such a way that they're kind of abstract that and what I, what I mean when I say that, if, if you're, if you're in a, some, you know, some, some nervous order liturgies, you're, you're in there, and you're kind of wondering, what's the focal point here? What is the what does the artist want me to see? What is the what is the focal point of the work? It should be the altar. Um, 
it, it should be, and I, I think in some of the older liturgies, I think we got this right. It, it wasn't hard to see this. We had a, we had the priest who was facing Calvary. He was facing um, our source of divine revelation. So we, we in in the church building, the Gothic and the Romanesque, it was it was both linear and transcendent. So we kind of we kind of knew what we were what what was the um the essential matter that we were supposed to be focusing on that at the moment but you go to some churches today you you participate in some liturgies today you just don't know what it is it the ambo is it the priest is it the choir sometimes we're at communion in some churches they have a communion line moving away from the altar whereas all processions in the liturgy should be moving in the same direction towards our our destination so I mean, do you do you, so? The way I narrated that, the way I described that, I mean, would you would you also say that maybe th there's some aspects of the liturgy today, and even our church churches way they're built today, that is just really just just another expression of abstract art. All right. Now, actually, uh, when I was living in Germany, I went to a church in Emmerich, which is right on the Dutch border, and walked in there, and first thing I see is a crucifix made out of automobile bumpers. And then along the side, I see abstract stations of the cross. That is a contradiction in term. Abs the stations of the cross are devotional aids, okay? It's a devotion. In order to, to enter into this devotion, you have to contemplate the suffering of Jesus Christ as portrayed by the artist on the station of the cross. If it's abstract, you can't enter into anything. This is a completely naive adoption of uh, artistic tropes that had nothing to do with the Catholic tradition or the tradition of art that were created in rebellion against the whole Western tradition of mimesis, as I just described with the story of Jackson yeah. Pollock. You got idiots, yeah. idiots who are building, uh, advising people to build a church, or you've got subversives like uh, Philip Johnson who built a chapel in Houston at the St. Thomas University that is a deliberately blasphemous work of architecture, and the stupid uh, priest even paid him for it. So you got everybody who is disoriented by the acceptance of non-memetic art at the beginning of the 20th century. That was a catastrophe for the liturgy. Now, if you're asking me, I think that the most significant development in Vatican II, the, uh, uh, after Vatican II in the United States of America, was the wrecking of liturgical music or musica sacra. And mm. that had to do with moral corruption, degeneracy, and I'm talking specifically about the late uh, Archbishop Rembert Weakland. Rembert Weakland studied music at Juilliard, okay, so he was certainly qualified, but he was homosexual. Yeah. And as a homosexual, he was foreclosed from the transcendental realm by his moral yeah. behavior. And yeah. he was he had a distorted soul, and as a result, he wanted some type of liturgical distortion. Now, yeah. this is a man to go a little bit away from music. When he was Archbishop of Milwaukee, he literally dynamited the Baldacchino, the beautiful marble Baldacchino in the cathedral in Milwaukee. The, the Everybody in Milwaukee, it wasn't just Catholics, everybody recognized that this was an architectural masterpiece. Please don't blow it up. And he gave him the finger and blew it up anyway, because as a homosexual, he hated the Catholic Church because he knew he was violating the moral law. And the Catholic Church always reminds you when you're violating the moral law. But the real damage he did was with music. And he basically created the folk mass or the hootenanny mass or whatever it was. And you imported folk music into the liturgy in a way that was completely inappropriate. I play folk music. I play, I, I play Irish music. I am no stranger to folk music. But I have also read Pius X's motu proprio on sacred music. <clears throat> I know what is sacred and what is not. And folk music is not musica sacra. Sorry, it's not. Mm. Opera. Uh, Pius X was obviously an Italian 
who love going to the opera, but opera is also not sacred music, much as you love opera. It's too emo it's too emotional, it's too powerful. He would go even as far to say that uh, Mozart's Requiem, these great masses, great works of art, Bach, Beethoven, all these people, that's not yeah. that's not musica sacra. It's not. Much as we love it, it's not. Much as it's great music, it is not appropriate for the liturgy because it, it's so powerful, it distracts you from the liturgy. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I already know what you think about the St. Louis Jesuits and their contribution to, to music. Here I am, Lord. <laughs> is it I, Lord? Why am I constantly singing about myself? Shouldn't I pay attention to you, Lord, instead of me, Lord? Right. I think, I mean, it's a great tune, you know, great tune. I give him credit. But it's, I, I have to say this, it's an expression of homosexual narcissism. Yeah. yeah. And it's not appropriate yeah. for the worship of God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never used those words, but yeah, I think that I always, always thought it was like self indulgent. I thought it was performancy, you know, kind of Broadway ish, right? Um, Here but yeah, I almost... am Lord, <laughs> ain't I great, Lord? Isn't that yeah. the, isn't that what the music is saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's that's, that's what it says to me. It's not like yeah. Biazire. It's not maledictus confutatus. No, it's I'm no. great. Well, that's the way American Catholics feel about themselves because they finally no. made it and blah, blah, blah. Just as the empire, the ship goes down, they're singing, here are my God to thee on the deck of the Titanic. That's, that's the kind of in-game type of yeah. music. I, I don't want to denigrate any of those guys, but uh, I think the guy, the guy who did write that is a homosexual. And I think that homosexuals have this narcissism, the narcissistic wound that basically colors everything they do. And I think that's an example of it. And yeah. you had basically, it came around around the same time that uh, Christopher Lash wrote The Culture of Narcissism. And I think it's a narcissistic piece of music that has no place in the, litur in the liturgy. Yeah. I think that's true. And... I don't know if you knew about this. Um, I think, you know, I sent it to you in one of my notes, but um, Bishop Barron, I think it had to be back. I don't know when I wrote this essay somewhere around 2013. He, he was, he's, he was still a priest back then. Um, and he was talking about something about you know, evangelizing through beauty. And uh, Father Barron back then, he thought that relativism had really become the modus operandi had just become you know just american culture relativism and and so there was really no way to break through that relativism with the first principle of just truth so he wanted to go around truth and and good and sort of just break through relativism with beauty right i i agree truth. i agree completely with him that's exactly the message of the book is that you can break through this thing where people can't think you can break through that that calcification with with uh, beauty i'm doing i'm doing a piece i'm going back to my roots now because i'm rereading nathaniel hawthorne i wrote my dissertation on nathaniel hawthorne 50 years ago oh, wow. and and uh i'm coming back to the marble fawn which is basically Hawthorne. Henry James said Hawthorne was a provincial guy. He was. He spent mm -hmm. his entire first 50 years of his life, he never moved out of New England villages. Okay? And now he uh, comes to Rome, and suddenly he's exposed to all of this art. And it's yeah. all like, <laughs> wow! You don't see St. Peter's Basilica in Concord, do you? You got these clapboard, whitewashed uh, Quaker meeting houses or congregational mm -hmm. meeting houses, which are nice in their way, but that's not beauty. That's not going to make you just stand there with your jaw dropped. Yeah. And that's precisely what he was exposed to. And this is his entree to Catholicism for the first time in his life. And um, he's struggling. He's struggling. You can see he's an artist. He can understand beauty. He's in the business of producing beauty. This is obviously beauty. But what's my response? Hawthorne is saying. And then the, the climax of 
the marble fawn is basically the other lady, one of the main characters, uh, goes to confession. Huh. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that what the Scarlet Letter is about? About how if yeah. you're a, a, a Protestant, uh, if you're a Calvinist minister, you can't go to confession because you're a living saint. You're one of the visible yeah. elect on earth. <laughs> you're the elect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I so, mean, but so, you, you know, beauty, beauty brought Hawthorne to the door of the church the same way that Handel's Messiah brought me to the door of the church. Yeah. And that's where the struggle begins. He actually went into St. Peter's and he goes on and on. But he's got this back and forth between this provincial Calvinist uh, bigot. <laughs> Is that too strong a word? <laughs> and being offered a new view of the world uh, and unable to accept it because I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but the church is run by Italians because it's in Rome. You can't accept I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, technically run. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Look, I may be different now, but certainly in 1858, it was Pius X, and it was a Roman Italian yeah. operation in Rome. No, no exceptions. Yeah, yeah. Um. Of course, the Sinoda path. We want to put that in the hands of women and children at this moment, but that's another, that's another story. But, but back to your point about the genesis. I mean, just where we're at today. You know, faith is a gift. You know, you know, full stop. But if, if we're talking about evangelizing through beauty is like a first principle, and you and you, you're doing that in a society that you call degenerate. You know, I, I would call post truth. I mean, how is that even? I mean, do, is is the understanding of uh, can we even touch upon beauty in such a way? Understand even get a hint of what beauty is to under even take take for instance someone 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 just going to Montreal right and and seeing going where going where? Montreal uh, oh Canada. Montreal okay yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and seeing I think that's a beautiful city. I mean, you all the streets were named after saints. Um, the Notre Dame Cathedral there is is very beautiful. It, it's just I, th I just think one of the most beautiful towns in in North America, most beautiful cities in North America. I just think it is. But look at the people who live there. I mean, again, we're talking about a, a, a city that's just completely lost, and they don't even know where they live. They don't even know everything that's around them is completely beautiful, and they're like in Plato's cave. They 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 can't. Un I don't. I don't know. That's I, a story. I mean, that's that's the story of of Europe in general, Germany in particular. What you had basically was Quebec as the Catholic French part of Canada being socially engineered, engineered, yeah. and the, Ju the Judas goat that led him into that was Pierre Trudeau, who may or may not be the father of the Trudeau, who's now the current uh, 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 Prime Minister of Canada. Mm -hmm. We're talking. So so nothing. You you, you can subvert duty. And that's precisely what the beginning, the first part of the book is about the rise of art in Italy. Well, it, you get so good at mimesis. One of the favorite things uh, men like to see is the naked female body. And you can yeah. say, go good at it. You can lead to concupiscence and then you can head into pornography. And that was precisely the crisis that happened in Rome in the middle of the 16th century. Basically, uh, Titian's friend, Aretino, Titian understood that completely. If you have that picture there of the musician, Venus and the musician, it, it explains the dynamic perfectly because there's he's there with one hand on the organ and he's turning around looking at Venus, the naked Venus behind him. Uh, that's precisely the position that Titian was in at that moment because he's got he, this is state of the art mimesis he can make that woman look so real that it can cause you to have problems uh, with your sexual passions uh, can we save that can we save this enterprise and i'm saying the church did save it it had mm. it, it was faced between two alternatives on the one hand you have aretino Titian's friend producing the first book of pornography in europe because of the technologies were printing press yeah. On the other hand, you have uh, the German mercenaries who come down. They're not paid. They sack Rome. They stable their horses in the Sistine Chapel, and they think, hey, I've never seen anything like this in Kaiserslautern. 
the 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 the, the, the naked form that was not that was Italy, and so it yeah. led to iconoclasm in Germany was as part of a one manifestation of the Reformation. So what's the church going to do? You're caught in the middle between pornography and iconoclasm. Do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? No. They validated sacred art, and Rubens is the man who basically embodied that kind of Baroque mm. post-Reformation aesthetic that was more exuberant than the Italians, if you can imagine yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I think I see your point. So, um, so back in 2013, when I when I was critical of Father Baron trying to use beauty as a first principle, I guess what I didn't understand was that the understanding of beauty needed a reformation. I think that's the part of the work that you're doing in your book. I think we first have to understand what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, and then if we know that, then then we can evangelize through it. Am I hearing that right? Yeah, if you, if, if for, in other words, the standard trajectory is moral decay because it's always happening. So if you engage in moral, if you engage in behavior that will cause uh, sin to take over your soul, uh, your soul will become twisted and you will start to desire things that are ugly because you're ugly, mm -hmm. because you have become ugly. Yeah. And you yeah. can't sell the difference anymore because you can't raise up, you can't rise up to that transcendental level anymore. And the whole world will become uglier and uglier as these people, more and more people become morally corrupt. We're living in that world right now. It's nothing but ugliness from start to finish here. Uh, music, yeah. an example. Music, I've already talked about music, about what uh, the, the, uh, the effect uh, in this book that uh, Wagner had. The, the, he, when, when he wrote uh, Tristan on his old, it had a devastating effect on German morals uh, during the last part of the 19th century. And if you want a good example of it, read Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. Thomas Mann never missed a performance of Tristan on his old, and it corrupted his morals. It gave him a permission slip to act out his homosexual desires. And that's what uh, Death in Venice is about. And Dr. E. Michael Jones, he has a whole section in his book on, on music um, in, in Germany. He's talking about poetry. Um, deeply fascinating book. It's called The Dangers of Beauty. You can find it at fidelitypress.org or culturewords.com. This is David L. Gray Show, Voicing Truth and Reason. I want to spend a few more minutes more minutes with um, Dr. E. Michael Jones, just digging deeper into this, into this conversation. I hope that... You're enjoying it, however you're watching or listening. And you, before we, um, before I came in there, you, 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 you spoke about just how everything there's reasons why you know things are ugly and why we pursue ugly. And the more people who are just caught up in this just moral decay, this degeneracy, the more ugliness there's going to be in in the world. We see that, as you said, we see that in, in pop uh, the popularity of pornography. There's an aspect of it that you said, I mean, clearly beautiful. The human body is beautiful, but um, the degenerate mind is corrupt and they're going to corrupt it and see and it, 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 it can become, become harmful. And, you know, obviously pornography, the number one website you know, has been for a long time, you know, porn websites. But I liked how you talk about how um, with the advent of the printing press is <laughs> we've been dealing with this for such a long time, but movies, I thought right. movies today are inclined towards the ugly as well. I think there's a lot of movies that I noticed that today are about just death, death, apocalypse, zombies. Yeah. I just want to go see a movie called John wick. I think it's on like a third or fourth or fifth iteration. And it deals with this assassin, <laughs> these assassins trying to kill each other. There is a beautiful aspect in the way the movie is designed. You know, these guys fighting and shooting and kicking and boxing. But it's just dealing with, with death. In the 60s and 70s, you probably remember this. You know, I was born in 72. But I remember, you know, watching, you know, shows like The Dukes of Hazard. You know, my grandfather, who was from Alabama, the show will, will come on. And I guess he had an issue with, you know, with the Confederate flag. So, you know, he'll turn away. But I wanted to watch Daisy Duke. You see, he's beautiful, right? And then you had these car crashes. 
I, I, I remember those. And um, it's just, I watch a lot of Korean dramas as well. Um, and, and I noticed, you know, they're starting to, their, their whole Hollywood thing is getting, catching a lot of steam. They're starting to introduce, you know, the, the, the characters of sexual deviancy. So you hear, you know, you right. see the Hollywood influence. Right. But they also have this common feature of car crashes. They all, every movie, every Korean drama, somebody's going to die from a car crash. It's, it's still this death. What's, what's the relationship between movies and art? In our in our current states of of moral decay, movies movies are film drama. Drama is uh, art that takes place in time. Uh, but uh, what happens over drama? The uh, Aristotle's uh, wrote the Poetics, and he said spectacle was the least important part of of drama. Well, now it's the most important part. If when you're getting to the movies, because they're, the, the, he said the plot is the soul of drama. Well, nobody cares about the plot. The plots are all cliched anyway. And what you're there for <laughs> is spectacle, which is basically what you're saying is car crashes and the naked female body. Now, saying that, what I'm also saying is that, oh, there was a time when the film was the cutting edge of uh, pornographic transgression. And the classic example of that was the uh, film. Hollywood in 1965 produced a film called The Pawn Broker, uh, which broke the production code. This was uh, the production code had been imposed on Hollywood Jews by the Catholics, who said for 31 years, from 33 uh, to 65, 32 years, no nudity, no ridicule of the clergy, no blasphemy, none of that type of stuff. And yeah, uh -huh. everybody went to more people went to the movies then than, than they're going now. Uh, but the Jews did weren't happy. And so they decided to break the code. And what they did was basically uh, have this woman in the pawnbroker takes off her shirt and they're bare breast on the screen. And that is the thin end of the wedge. Now, in my book, John Cardinal Kroll and the Cultural Revolution, I talked about the that from the insider perspective because I saw all the letters back and forth between Monsignor Little and Eli Landau, uh, who was the pr producer of the pawnbroker. Back and forth, Landau saying, hey, it's great art. And also, you have to add this in, it was the Holocaust. Basically, the Holocaust justified nudity. That's And the Catholics were completely paralyzed and completely dumbfounded. Now, Monsignor Little was not. So he said to Landau, basically, uh, you got this black prostitute. Do it this way. Have her shoot the scene with her back to the camera and Rod Steiger's face. And that way Rod Steiger can act and you got a much more dramatic scene. Well, no, that's not what they wanted. They wanted bare breast. Well, that was the whole point of this movie. Use the Holocaust to smuggle bare tits onto the big screen. That's what it was about. And that was the thin end of the wedge that led to within seven years, deep throat, uh, devil and Miss Jones in first run movies. The Jews wow. were behind this. The Jews are behind pornography. They still are today. And the fact that we're in this mess right now is largely because the Catholic Church lost its nerve and the Legion of Decency uh, couldn't uh, basically make this condemnation stick. Another place where we see Jewish influence, though, and a lot of people don't know this, some people don't pay attention. Um Speaking about music, um, you know, I, I remember coming up in, you know, I was born in 72, but, you know, I was really raised in the 80s. I was raised in, in the culture, you know, I was, um, you know, largely a middle class kid. You know, I think, you know, for most part, um, I was probably the only black kid in class, you know, so I really wasn't into the, the, the I wasn't I wasn't raised in a place where there was that culture of hip hop and things like that. But I had outlets, you know, uh, on a weekend, and and I re I remember, you know, kids break dancing in the street, and I, and I remember with cardboard, you know, with beatbox, yeah, big boom boxes, yeah. And I, I I remember what hip hop was when it first started. It had a cultural message. It there was a there was a beauty to it. It it it, it said something, and it resonated with me as well. Then all of a sudden, it, it goes to again this death, this. Um, just this message of poverty and it, it changed. Um, you know, that's you had because, the group NWA and, that's and because, NWA was funded by, you know, the Jews, right? Right. Look, the man who, who took it over was Rick Rubin. Yeah. 
a Jew. He was uh, he was from uh, uh, the, uh, New York. He went to NYU. He used to play it around. So he collaborated. It's it's it was like jazz. Jazz was a basically the Jewish appropriation of uh, basically black black music, and then the commercialization of that uh, of that music. Rick Rubin did exactly the same thing when he created rap music, and that was uh, you know that's the end of music. It's so yeah, violent. It was never the same. It was never it's the same. Not, it's not music. David Crosby just died recently. He said, yeah, yeah, it's not music. It isn't music. It's, it's, it's transgressive noise. And he was good at doing that. And that was the cutting edge because Jews are always on the cutting edge of transgression one, when it comes to the arts. And this music was transgressive. It was transgressive music. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 um, it's interesting that you said that the too many Catholics and too many Catholic prelates just capitulated to um, this this culture of these um, type of Jews who wanted to take over entertainment and media, but how's that? Were you saying that Catholics were in these spaces at first? No, Hollywood was always Jewish from the very okay. beginning. Okay? Okay, okay. But by the 1920s, everybody in America was upset at what the Jews were doing in Hollywood. There were the, all these pre-code films are smuggling nudity, nudity, homosexuality, ridicule of the clergy, and somebody's got to do something. There are only three possibilities here. It's Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. They are the three ethnic groups in America, and the Jews are the transgressor. So first the Protestants tried with the Will Hayes Commission. He doesn't get anywhere. And then the Catholics, who were the stronger, stronger than they've ever, ever been, uh, basically went to the movie, the money guys, like Mr. Antonioni, Antonini, whatever his name was, the Italian who ran Bank of America, at, at the moment when the Jews were really financially vulnerable. So the stock market crash of 1929 was exactly the moment when they got into big time debt because they were transitioning to talking pictures. So now they're in debt and now the Catholics come and say, you, you're not going to do this anymore. We're cutting off your money. And Antonioni went along with that. And at that point, uh, Cardinal Doherty of Philadelphia calls up for a boycott of movie theaters in Philadelphia. Warner, right. Brothers, Warner Brothers is losing $100,000 a week in Philadelphia alone. This, uh, Joe Breen, the guy who was the man who was the agent, their agent in Hollywood, said Harry Warner is crying tears as big as horse turds because he's losing $100,000 a week. And that, the threat was... You keep this up, it's going to spread to Chicago, to New York, every single big city with a large Catholic population. They're going to stop going to the movies. And so the Jews capitulated and they implemented the production code. 32 years later, the Catholics lost their nerve, largely because of Vatican II, largely because of Nostra Aetate and this whole new uh, era of collaboration mm. with the Jews. Oh, they're our friends. We're going to collaborate with them. Well, that was a disaster. It's been, uh, that was what let pornography in to where it's dominating our culture, where you don't even know anymore where it's going to show up no, on, no. if you're on the Internet. Yeah, you don't even know anymore. Dr. Michael Jones, how would you – Um, this is a David L. Gray show, voicing truth and reason. If you listen to on Apple iTunes, drop me a review. Um, we've been speaking with Dr. E. Michael Jones largely about – some of the subjects he covered in his book, The Dangers of Beauty, the conflict between mimesis and concupiscence in the fine arts. You can find this book at fidelitypress.org or culturewars.com. And also click on the link below if you're watching on one of the video platforms and check out the interview that Dr. Jones did over on Patrick Coffin's um, platform about the book where it's more more of a book review and um patrick's also quoting out of the book but um and this is something like a follow-up but dr jones i wanted to close um our talk and i want to ask you about i mean where do we where do we go from here you you laid out the problem clearly um you you laid out the condition that we're in degeneracy so 
what's the solution? Is there a solution or is it yeah, too late? The solution, I mean, what do you the, think? Solu the solution is beauty. Solution is beauty because beauty has a power all uh, by itself. It's a transcendental. So what did Aquinas say? Aquinas said we have a desire for beauty, a need for beauty. And if we are frustrated in that need by being forced to live in ugly circumstances, mm. we will seek, if, if you're not given a, an outlet, a higher outlet, you will seek it in the lower. And I guarantee you the lower means the only thing, if you live in an ugly environment, the only thing that's beautiful anymore is the female body. And you will become addicted to images like that and you'll end up in pornography. That's wow. so we have to we have to have some type of beauty in our lives now that will keep us focused on the transcendental level and not allow us to be become slaves of our passions. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe in political um, solutions. I believe you know in political problems, <laughs> and so but in a in a political sphere, I mean. Um, <laughs> that like I said, they have a propensity to make problems than you know create solutions. But is there is there something there in in policy that 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 what you clearly just articulated about beauty that can work there as well? Well, I mean, when Donald Trump was president, he appointed Duncan Stroik. Uh, who's the architecture professor at Notre Dame uh, and the successor of Thomas Gordon Smith, the man who brought classical architecture to the Notre Dame architecture school. He appointed him in charge of basically all the, the architecture of all public buildings, that they had to be in some sense beautiful. And so we're not going to have these uh, spaceships, you know, look like, oh, the spaceship just landed. Oh, no, that's the post office or something like that. Or brutalist things like the city hall in uh, Dallas or in uh Austin as well. No more brutalism. We're going to work with modest, beautiful buildings. Well, Trump's no longer in office. Now you've got the revolutionaries. You've got uh, basically a, a Biden administration run by Jews. They, uh, at the beginning, they called it Biden's minion. So you got a secretary of state who doesn't know how to talk, doesn't know how to negotiate. you got a sec uh, an attorney general who prosecutes Catholics for being pro-life. you got a, a, a head of Homeland Security who uh, can't uh, pr pr protect the border, and you got a Secretary of Treasury who thinks uh, uh, can't stop the banks from failing, but can go over to the Ukraine and give uh, a billion dollars to the Jew who's running that looting operation. So obviously, we're we're in trouble in that regard uh, because the revolutionaries have taken over our culture. But again, I mean, everything begins with consciousness. And uh, mm -hmm. we are raising consciousness about what beauty is and how that is in a way of uh, entering into the transcendental realm. And if you have a house, uh, 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 your wife can make it beautiful. If you have a garden, you can have beauty there too. Uh, it's, it's a small beginning, but it is a, a beginning. Uh, that's, that's where we have to start. You have to, it's especially important when you have children because children, if there's ever a mimetic uh, group of people, it's children. They imitate. They imitate nature, and they could recognize the imitation of nature and take delight in it. I have a two-year-old son who can, who's composing his own songs now, simply because that's the way that the child's mind works. So that's that's the that's the program, as far as I can tell. I don't see any big uh, unless there's some type of big counter revolution. Uh, that's where it's got to start, and that consciousness has to spread. And we have to be honest with each other, and we have to tell the truth. And not constantly uh, avoid issues because somebody's going to get mad at us. Dr. Michael Jones, thanks for coming on the David L. Gray Show. Really appreciate your time. You enlighten us and you enlighten me. And I thank you. Thank you. <laughs>